All righty. So we're going to talk about planting a pollinator garden. And there's so many good reasons that you may want to plant a pollinator garden. I was thinking about, um, about this, that when I first started working here, I was giving presentations about planting a butterfly garden, but the whole orientation around it was really more for our personal delight than, um, than for helping out pollinators. It was really just creating a more lively garden. And it really does create a more lively garden. I have a pollinator garden right outside my front door. And whenever I look out there, there's butterflies flitting around and it's just wonderful. But I think the point I'm, I'm gonna make a little bit today is that gardeners have also become guardians, kind of guardians of the natural world, if you will. And um, so not only when we create our pollinator garden, are we creating a thing of beauty, but we're also creating something that offers ecosystem services to critters that live on our planet, particularly in this case, pollinators. And um, one of the big issues with pollinators is that um, they, a lot of habitat has been lost across the globe and in the United States. If you think about your own community, either where you live now or where you grew up, think about how much less land is dedicated to wild space than um, Ruth, five years ago, uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, Ruth, can you uh, project more? Okay, let me see. Is that better? Joy? Um, sounds the same to me, but multiple folks are mentioning that you're, you're pretty quiet. Hmm, okay. I'll do my best, y'all. Um, I hope this is better. <laughs> Okay, so why do we need pollinators? Well, one out of every three bites that we eat requires a pollinator. So our own food uh, necessitates needing a pollinator. So if we're losing pollinators across the US and across the planet, we need to pay attention to that and do what we can to buoy up pollinators because honestly, it's in our own best interest. They are essential, as essential as sunlight, soil, and water for much of the food you eat. Not only that, about 87% of the world's plants require a pollinator, whether that's a food we eat or not, that that, that plant needs a pollinator to pollinate it so it can make seed and therefore reproduce itself. Um, so we have taken pollinators for granted until just very, very recently. Um, and now we're starting to pay attention and that's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> so aside from just pollinators, land dwelling insects are declining at an alarming rate, 9% per year. I don't know where that red stripe came from, sorry. And, <laughs> In 2019, CNN reported that 40% of insects could become extinct in the next few decades, 40%. And a lot of the insects on our planet have not even really been documented. There's lots of insects around. We're discovering new insects every single year and they're so tiny that it's hard to, to know who all of them are. So there are a lot of things that have led to pollinator decline. Habitat loss is one, pesticide use is another. Um, and that habitat loss isn't just for um, neighborhoods being built. It's also things like our farm fields used to be, used to have um, borders on them that weeds would grow up in and these weeds would foster pollinators 
but farmers are really pressed to make a living. They've expanded their fields to the very, very edge. It used to be that in the farm fields, the farmers wouldn't do that last run through um, to cut the weeds down. So things like milkweed would come up in the rows and those plants would be accessible to pollinators. But the great thing is all of us can help even if all we have is a few little pots on our porch or balcony. So we can plant habitat. We can create a year round haven for pollinators. And what that means is that um, it's not just the plants, but it's kind of a way of looking at the environment that uh, fosters more pollinators surviving from year to year. We can reduce or eliminate our pesticide use. That's very important. There are lots of ecosystem benefits that insects provide that we don't even think about. Things like dung beetles that help decompose all the stuff we don't need anymore that are basically turning it into soil for us. And um, we can teach our children about pollinators, very important, and to inspire and educate other people about pollinators. The other thing we can do is just think of how we can nurture nature by supporting initiatives, by supporting organizations that are, are helping in these ways. And we can also support local beekeepers as opposed to buying tea, uh, excuse me, honey from China or some far flung place across the globe. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about pollination. I just want to check in. How is the, are y'all hearing me any better? Uh, results are mixed. Okay. Sorry, people. I don't know why my picture's not up there. Maybe that has something to do with it. I, I'm not, I'm not sure, but okay. I'm just going to keep moving forward. Um, so plants and animals have evolved together and plants actually trade their nectar and pollen with animals, mostly insects, to ensure pollination. And that ensures that the, the plant is producing seed and therefore making new plants. So it, it ensures that the, the plant lives on. And so this is a symbiotic relationship. The first flowering plants evolved over 100 million years ago long before we were on the planet. And at that point, many wasps evolved into bees. And bees, if you think about a bumblebee and how hairy it is, and even a, um, a honeybee, it's very hairy compared to the smooth body we think of a wasp having. And the hairy bodies of bees are meant to collect that pollen. So that pollen sticks to the bee's body. The bee actually has pollen sacs on its legs where it stores the pollen until it can get back to its um, hive or its home. Uh, honeybees live in hives, but most, most of our native bees, many of them are solitary bees or it's a very small gathering of bees. Um, so the only place that bees or butterflies or hummingbirds and other pollinators can get this nectar and pollen is from flowers. So when a honeybee, bumblebee, sweat bee, all these different bees are feeding on the flower, she has a little mouth part that I was going to demonstrate, but since you can't see me, I can't demonstrate it. But um, it's called a proboscis and it's kind of like a straw that they unroll and stick down into the flower and sip that nectar. And different bees have different lengths of proboscis and, and that comes into the kind of plants that you wanna plant because some uh, bees with a short proboscis are gonna be more suited to maybe a flat plant like a daisy type flower, whereas a a critter with a very long proboscis can go deep into that flower to suck the honey out. And if you see a bee kind of dancing around the flower, 
I see that a lot on the roses here. Um, she's gathering pollen. So if, if they're sucking, they're gathering nectar. And if they're sort of dancing around, rolling around in the, in the flower, they're collecting pollen. And just a little example so we know what we're talking about. So there's the incomplete versus the complete flower. So the, the flower on the left is a squash flower. And that flower has, that plant has two different flowers on it, a male flower and a female flower. And so the bees go back and forth between those flowers to pollinate that plant and make a squash. So if you look at the, that flower, the one with the little ball underneath it, that is the baby squash starting to make. So that male um, flower has pollinated that female flower with the help of a special bumblebee, a squash bumblebee that has evolved just with squash, which is an indigenous plant to North America. On the um, right hand side, we've got what would be a complete flower. So we've got all the male and female parts in one flower. So that part up the middle is the female part. And at the bottom of that, the oval shaped thing is the ovary. So when the critter visits the flower, all those little, um, the anthers, those are the male parts. They're going to get um, pollen on them from that and then accidentally possibly brush against the top of the stigma and that um, pollen is gonna go down to the bottom, go down that style and go down to the ovary and fertilize that flower, which therefore starts the seed making process. There are over 4,000 native bees in North America. And I believe, um, oh, I, the number isn't on the top of my head, but I feel like it's maybe 200 native bees in North Carolina. I saw um, Lisa Wagner here. She may know if she does uh, correct me, Lisa. Um, but 25% of bumblebees are thought to be in serious decline. And um, it's, this is a thing that's very hard to measure. It's much easier to measure decline in something like a honeybee where it's enclosed in a box. And if all the bees die or 20% of the bees die, it's a measurable, it's a measurable impact. Whereas gathering a lot of honeybees to, uh, excuse me, bumblebees, it's much harder to gather that kind of data. But the important part about this is that our native bees and our native flowers have evolved together. And therefore, it is important when we're thinking about our pollinator gardens to include as many native flowers as we can, because that's going to support the wild bee population. Honeybees aren't native, they're from Europe, but they do love native plants too. They will definitely feed on all these plants. So that will, native plants will also support honeybees. We also wanna plant for butterflies. And when we're planting for butterflies, we're not just planting flowers, we're also planting their host plant. So butterflies are mainly gonna feed on the nectar. And then when um, they have mated, they're gonna lay their eggs on a specific plant that is called a host plant, but specific butterflies only like certain host plants. For instance, in this picture, you see the monarch butterfly is feeding on an echinacea or a purple cone flower, but when it lays its eggs, it's going to wanna to lay its eggs on a milkweed. In this picture, you're seeing a butterfly weed, which is a milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. So they're, eggs need to hatch on the milkweed so that when the baby caterpillar eats the milkweed plant, it is kind of ingesting a poison, something that actually protects the caterpillar and the butterfly because it's distasteful to most other creatures. And that bright, bright color 
of the monarch butterfly is warning these creatures that I'm not going to taste good. So um, when the caterpillars start feeding, they're going to start eating the leaves of your host plant and they're gonna go through a number of instars, which is like cycles where they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And when they're ready, they're going to become a chrysalis. And then the magic happens that a few weeks later they emerge as a butterfly. You also want to plant for hummingbirds. Over 160 North American plants depend on the hummingbird for pollination. And I just read this exciting fact this year, and it says said that hummingbirds will return to the exact place where they fed last year, to the exact plant or the exact spot where you had a feeder hung. They can remember that specifically. I can't believe that's even possible, but that is true. So if you do hang out a hummingbird feeder, that hummingbird is going to be expecting that feeder in the same spot the next year. So just think about that. Same with the plants. There are lots of other pollinators, flies, beetles, mammals, bats. The bats that are pollinators are not on the East Coast. They're more like in the deserty sections of our country like um, California and New Mexico and Arizona. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about putting your garden together. You wanna think about planting flowers that bloom in every season, particularly the early season flowers and the late season flowers because there are less flowers available to pollinators then. Ideally, these are native flowers. And also remember to include trees because trees, especially early in the year, offer a lot of floral resources to our pollinators. Um, and when, I, the, the thing about the design is to, it's twofold. One, these design ideas are best for the pollinator, but they also are the prettiest way to design your garden. So it's a win-win situation. So you think about different heights of flowers, different flower shapes. So maybe some are flat like a daisy with a landing pad for the pollinator. Some are tubular and very deep for those creatures with longer proboscis or hummingbirds. Think about different flowers because bees and butterflies and um, hummingbirds are all attracted to certain flowers and even different scents. So for instance, a viburnum oftentimes, have, there are some sweet viburnums, but many of them have a dead meat smell as their scent and that attracts pollinating flies. So you wanna think about a diversity of scents so that you're, cre you're creating a habitat that's going to attract the, the mo most diverse number of pollinators. The other thing you wanna think about is making each clump of flowers at least three to four feet so that when that pollinator comes in, they can feed, 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 feed on just one clump of flowers. Now, when you're designing, you wanna, you're, let's say you're at Reams Creek Nursery and you think, oh, I love that plant. Well, always read the label to see what, um, how large that plant is going to be so that you're able to design accordingly. Some plants, you would only need to buy one plant because it's going to turn into a three to four foot clump. Other plants, you may need to buy three to five plants to end up with a nice size clump for the pollinators to feed. But the other thing about these big clumps is visually in your garden, and this is for the human pleasure, um, that big patch of flowers is just going to look prettier and have more zing, have more flower power in your garden. Um, <clears throat> pollinators love sunny spots. They love spots that are sheltered from the wind, but there are also lots of shade plants that pollinators will feed on. Um, 
also, I think it's really important to think about where you put your pollinator garden so that you can enjoy it. Now, if your whole yard is the pollinator garden, um, this may or may not be possible, but there could be a certain part of your garden that's a little amped up that you can sit on your front porch and enjoy or um, sit on your spot where you like to read and, and, and see the garden happening and see all the actions, see all the butterflies fluttering around. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about plants. One, think early season, mid season and late season bloomers. I've show, I have pictured here some trees that we may forget about how important these are, but the, that top picture, tulip poplar flowers, red maple flowers, these are both very, very early season flowers that provide a lot of resources for pollinators. And if we have a late frost, oftentimes these flowers are killed and that really hurt, puts a hurting on the pollinators. Red buckeye is another tree that is one of the very first trees that um, hummingbirds feed on when they come into our region. And red buds are just everywhere. Many of us have them in their our yards. Many of us, um, we see them as we ride down the interstate. So those are just a few, a little handful of, of early blooming trees to think about. Um, also flowering shrubs. There are lots of flowering shrubs that are gonna be available in each season of the year. And the other thing, um, these are not necessarily natives, but I think evergreens are an important um, contribution to the pollinator garden because they depends on how they're oriented, but they can provide protection from the wind. They can make a place for butterflies to warm their wings before they can fly. Butterflies' wings have to reach a certain temperature before they're able to fly. Oftentimes, evergreens are war a warm spot that helps the butterfly warm its wings up. And it all, they also provide some some structure and relief for the garden for your eye, just something for your to provide a backdrop for your flowering plants and also to provide some structure in the winter time. Here are a few gorgeous shrubs. All of these are native shrubs. We're talking about our flame azalea, um, which is calendulaceum, itea or Virginia sweet spire is one of the very early bloomers, shrub bloomers. Um, maybe the next one along the way is St. John's wort. This is one called sun, um, Sunburst. Annabelle is blooming right about at the same time. That's a hydrangea. And then um, oak leaves are also blooming right now. Clethra hasn't really started blooming in my garden yet, but it's putting on flower buds. And I have to say, Clethra is one of my favorite shrubs for pollinators, super fragrant. And it does come in a number of sizes. The smallest one that I can think of is Sugartina, which stays maybe two and a half to three tall and wide. There's one, um, called pink something that gets considerably larger, six to eight feet tall. So there's a, a range in there, but there are lots of shrubs uh, available. Okay, so here's some early blooming perennials. Blanket flower is a great um, native plant that if you, if you have blanket flower in the ground, it starts blooming early. And if you keep blanket flower deadheaded, it will continue to bloom into fall, possibly into, into frost. It's just a great flower. Tall verbena is one we love here. It's in my pollinator garden at home. It's in our pollinator garden um, at the nursery. Not a native plant, but butterflies definitely love it. And also goldfinch love it later in the season when it starts making seeds. It's very tall and airy. It's called a C3 plant. Um, so you, it can kind of pop up anywhere in your garden and, and look great. 
violets are not something we sell at the nursery, but most of us have them in our yards that pop up in the early spring with flowers, but they are also a host plant. I cannot remember for which butterfly. So maybe be um, sure to leave a few of your violets somewhere for the pollinators. A few other things, believe it or not, creeping phlox is a native plant and um, beautiful early spring bloomer. Candy tuft is not native, but it is a great plant and that it, it spills really nicely over walls. The candy tuft in our pollinator garden, this is it, and it is um, on a stone wall, so it does have kind of a microclimate, but I think this plant had a few flowers on it in January, and I cut it back maybe two weeks ago. It still had a few hanging on flowers at that point, so really get a lot of show. And at some point, it's just covered to the max with flowers, which you see here. Um, this next picture is my garden at home. And you can see on the right-hand side is a coreopsis called Nana. It's an early blooming coreopsis. It stays really low. And that is a native plant. Next to it is catmint, which is not a native plant, but it's also a very nice early bloomer. We have it in our pollinator garden here, and it just gets covered with flowers. If you at some point cut it back, you may get a second bloom. So um, once it, right now, I've already um, cut that uh, coreopsis mostly all the way back. I'm hoping for a second bloom and the nepotus starting in my garden to look pretty straggly. So, but it has been blooming now for gosh, at least a couple of months, right, Joy? Maybe more? Joy, you're muted. Uh, sorry, yeah, no, ours has been like going like gangbusters. It's always covered in bees and it has been blooming for a while. Yeah, yeah. Okay, a few other examples. Um, on, the, on the far left, you're gonna see this pink yarrow blooming. This, this is in my garden and I planted one one gallon plant and I promise you, this plant now covers at least a four by four square foot area. Um, and it, it is such a hard working plant. It just, if you keep deadheading it, it's still gonna continue to bloom. Sometimes about uh, the middle of the summer, I sort of cut the whole business to the ground because it starts looking bad and it comes right back and starts flowering again. That's a different coreopsis in, in the background. It's a taller coreopsis. And that sort of tall, spiky looking thing is liatris, which we'll see a little later. Over on the right-hand side, under a Japanese maple tree in my yard, I have um, Phlox stolonifera planted. It's a woodland phlox that likes some shade. And also mixed in there, I have columbine, which is just a beautiful, beautiful, early blooming plant. Both of these are very early. <clears throat> Here's the, um, so now we're getting into mid-season bloomers. This is the liatris I was talking about on the left, the purple, um, the blazing star, and just behind it in this picture you'll see echinacea. This is not blooming yet either at my house or in our pollinator garden here, but it's sending up the spikes already. And then on the right-hand side, we've got echinacea, purple cone flower, great pollinator plant. Also another plant that the goldfinch love in the fall if you leave the um, flower heads, the seed heads on. And in the middle, we've got a Turk's cap lily. And all three of these plants are native and native to our area. Turk's cap lily can take sun. It can also take shade. It gets really tall, maybe six feet tall. And it's a little bit hard to find. We rarely have it um, for sale at the nursery. I bought a plant at the um, Weaverville tailgate market a few years ago. That's how I got mine. Um, but you do want to make sure when you buy something like a, a wild plant that it has been um, not dug up in the wild. 
but that it's been properly propagated, um, not dug up. Uh, to We don't want to take our wild plants out of the forest. So a few other wonderful pollinator plants. This is Moonbeam coreopsis on the left. It's a pretty pale yellow flower with kind of a dark green thready foliage. Really, really pretty. Really likes good drainage. So when you plant that plant, take the time to really amend your soil. On the right hand side, we've got sneezeweed or helenium. That plant last year in our pollinator garden started blooming really early and bloomed a very long time. And, in, and that's a native. In the middle, we have Agastache blue fortune, which I have in my at my house and also we have it here in our pollinator garden. It's not a native, it's a, a, na a native by, not native to Western North Carolina, but native to North America, hybrid with an Asian um, hyssop. So um, this one's not native, but I'm telling you the bees love this plant. If you really take the time to just look, stop and look, you'll see all different kinds and sizes of bees visiting this plant and it has a massively long bloom time. It's mine isn't blooming yet at my house, but the one here is starting to bloom and it just keeps blooming into fall. It's fantastic. Okay, another patch. These are all native plants. So that purple flower on the left-hand side is Homestead Verbena. And it's a really nice early blooming plant if you already have it in the ground. And if you keep it deadheaded, it will really bloom prolifically through the season. On the right hand side, we've got bee balm. If you go out in the woods around here, you're oftentimes going to see red bee balm growing wild in the woods. Um, this, but you know, we also, these are things we also have at the nursery. In the middle, we've got, uh, a Joe Pye weed, Baby Joe. This is technically not native to Western North Carolina, but it is native a little more broadly, like in the Piedmont and, and down into Eastern North Carolina. Wonderful plant. The nice thing about this is it is a little shorter. It maybe only gets four feet tall compared to our native ones, which get maybe 12 feet tall. So, um, and as you can see that, that tiger swallowtail is loving it and feeding on it. Um, definitely want to think about including milkweeds in your garden because these are host plants for the monarch butterfly. Um, we have lots of common milkweed at the nursery. There's, it's coming up everywhere. It's coming up in the front, uh, in our exit. There's tons of it. We've got swamp milkweed um, planted in our pollinator garden. We had butterfly weed in our pollinator garden and I pulled it up because I thought it was a weed and I haven't had a chance to replant it yet. But um, one thing to think about with the milkweeds is you may not want these front and center of your garden because after they get um, one, they oftentimes get covered in orange aphids, just literally covered. There are lots of crazy bugs that like to visit them, especially the common milkweed. And so if it's gonna bother you to see a plant that is just all eaten up, then you might wanna put this in a different spot in your garden, not front and center. But these are really um, necessary for monarchs to survive, the, their only host plant are, are in, the milk, in the milkweed family. So um, all three of these are native to this region and there's actually, I think a couple more. This is just a beautiful picture. This is the pollinator garden in Pittsburgh that Debbie Roos, who's an extension agent there put together. She, it's a pretty extensive pollinator garden she is on Instagram if you want to follow her. She's always posting lots of things about her pollinator garden and her dog. Um, she's an excellent photographer and she has been doing this for years. If you Google Chatham County pollinator garden, 
or Debbie Reese. She has a whole website with plant lists and lots of great information. <clears throat> All right, so some later bloomers. So on the left, we've got Black Eyed Susan. Um, this one is native to this region. This is called gold, this cultivar is called Goldstrom. There is some discussion in the um, land of best for pollinators that ideally you would plant native plants that are not cultivars, but are the straight species. Um, and that is because that plant is going to have a broader genetic diversity than the cultivars are going to have. However, it's very challenging to find straight species plants. So I am just going to say, if you can, that's fantastic. But we do have a lot of these plants available. Occasionally, we'll have the straight species, but oftentimes it is a cultivar. In the middle, we've got Peachy's Pick Stokes Aster, which is just a beautiful, beautiful flower. And it looks really purple in this picture, but it's actually more of a periwinkle blue. It, the peachy has to do with the human's name. It's not the color of the flower. And so if you look in the, um, the picture on the right, you can see there's zinnias. This is my garden at home. You can see some red salvia coming up and you can see the stochesia or the Stokes aster in the background. And it's just a beautiful color and also adds real pretty color to the late garden. Um, zinnias, I love having zinnias. You wouldn't believe all the different pollinators that visit zinnias, including hummingbirds. And those, um, those red salvias just reseed every year and they haven't really come back up yet, but um, I'm sure they will. A few other favorites. So on the left hand side, we've got a perennial mum and we usually sell in the fall four to five different perennial mums. These are not native, but they are really late bloomers and they are just loved by pollinators. They just super attract pollinators. They spread really well. So one plant, one one gallon plant is probably sufficient because in a few years, you will have a good clump of this plant. You'll probably be digging parts of it up and giving it away to your friends. Right, Joy? <laughs> and then um, on the right-hand side, we've got a really wonderful aster called October Skies. Um, that is a pretty true to um, color picture of it. It gets completely covered with these aster flowers. We have this in our pollinator garden at the nursery. And when the first year we planted it, in part I planted it because Diane Allman, who's a local pollinator expert, that was one of her favorite picks. And so we planted that and I was like, oh gosh, that thing looks weedy. I didn't really like it. And then it started blooming and it was completely covered with the this, roundy moundy of beautiful flowers and it stayed in bloom for quite some time so I'm a total convert to October skies I have it in my home garden as well and then um, in the middle we've got goldenrod I think this one is fireworks and goldenrod is I have to say it's a native plant too I'm not sure the entire United States, but I can say that I have seen it from way up north to Florida and over to um, Minnesota. And so I'm sure that in all those places, goldenrod blooms and provides resources for pollinators. Um, my father's house got bulldozed after one of the hurricanes and it, that whole lot, which was a huge lot, became basically a meadow full of goldenrod, just like, you know, the goldenrod just came in and took over. So thinking about your home garden, you sometimes have to keep your eye on goldenrod because it does spread readily. And there are different um, sizes that you can buy and different looks of goldenrod. Um, 
if you're up at Craggy Gardens, one of my favorite ones is sort of at that bald, not at the pinnacle, but the other Craggy Gardens where there's um, sort of a bald at the top. There's a beautiful goldenrod there that has a deep purpley maroon stems, just gorgeous. I don't know why it hasn't been propagated and turned into a, a plant that garden centers sell. <clears throat> a few more um, later bloomers. So this Coreopsis is in my garden. It's Coreopsis full moon. And um, this is an example of paying attention to what the size of the plant is going to be. So when you look at that plant label and it says 18 inches to 24 inches wide, I would definitely go for the 24 inch wide spacing. And in this case, this plant was supposed to be two feet wide. It was four feet wide in my garden last year. It was huge and just covered with blooms for such a long time. I really enjoyed it. Um, in the middle, we've got a tall phlox called Gina. And if you notice, the flowers are a little bit smaller on this particular phlox, but this phlox was studied at Mount Cuba Center. And it was one of the phloxes, tall phloxes are um, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of these plants we've been talking about are susceptible to powdery mildew. Um, tall phlox can get it, bee balm can get it, uh, coreopsis can get it. And we'll talk about a way to manage that in a minute. But this particular phlox was um, the mo their most resistant one to powdery mildew, but they also found that it was very, very visited by pollinators. Mm -hmm. And I saw it in a bouquet in an arrangement downtown at a fair and was like, what is that? I just thought it was so pretty too. So on the, then on the right hand side, we've got zinnias. I just sort of said a little shout out to zinnias because zinnias are such an easy plant. If you don't have a huge budget, you can go buy a few seed packs and, you know, for four to six dollars, have an incredible garden just with zinnias. They're not native, but they just are so gorgeous. And I have found that my zinnias reseed every year in my garden. So I've got a whole bunch of baby zinnias coming up right now that I have to move around and um, plant in different places. <clears throat> so back on talking about host plants, very important. If you want to have butterflies, you're going to want to have host plants in your yard and garden. On the, so on this um, right hand side, I have a little list. The picture might be covering some of it up. It's milkweed and black cohosh at the top. These are certainly not all of the host plants. I just went through the bee city list and came up with a few that some of them were surprising to me. I don't even think I put it on here, but some of the black-eyed Susans are host plants. Spotted Joe Pieweed, host plant. Um, the bee balm, like the red one I showed you, host plant. Goldenrod, host plant. New England aster. So many of these things are host plants. So um, on back on the pictures, this this is a black swallowtail caterpillar, and it's important to recognize these caterpillars because if you see them on your plants, you might freak out. They're eating the plant, but really that is the intention if you planted that plant as a host plant. I think this is dill that rather than fennel. Fennel looks a lot like dill, and um, I love bronze fennel as a host plant. I, I think this picture was taken in on the tables in the nursery a few years ago. There were these caterpillars all over the dill we were selling, you know, so we moved them to our pollinator garden. Um, that spice bush swallowtail, last year I bought a spice bush and I have still have not even planted it. I potted it up into a larger pot because I just had to have a spice bush. And look at this adorable caterpillar. So it was fall time and I was thinking about my spice bush. I had seen no action, no butterflies, nothing. And so then I read about it and I read that the uh, with the spice bush, 
the caterpillar will make the leaves curl up around themselves and hide them. So I couldn't see the caterpillar. So when I went up to my plant and started peeling back the leaves, look who I found, this mm -hmm. adorable cutie pie. And those are like false eyes on that caterpillar to um, make it look more scary to predators. So cute. And then the same thing happened to me with, um, I also bought a passion flower vine, potted it into a larger pot because I'm not sure where I'm going to put it yet, but I had to have one. And so I was looking at one of the flowers and all of a sudden my eyes changed focus and I saw all these caterpillars and I was like, oh my God. So both of these are such a good example of plant it and they will come, right? I had, didn't see the Gulf fritillary in my garden. I never noticed it, but it ob obviously was there. These guys pretty much stripped this plant of leaves. And then of course the monarch, there's the monarch caterpillar. It looks a little bit similar to the black swallowtail, um, but it's important that you recognize these guys so you don't accidentally kill the very critters that you're trying to support. And in general, most of the caterpillars um, that we're going to see are, are going to be beneficial butterflies. There is one that is all over my garden. In fact, in my, my pollinator garden right now, the main butterflies I see at the moment are not very exciting. They're the white cabbage butterfly. They're um, some other butterflies. I'm not even sure what the name of them are, but they're small. They're not showy. They're very common, but they are flittering everywhere. So the host plant for the white cabbage butterfly is what? Your kale, your collards, that is their host plant. So when it comes over to my vegetable garden, I might handle um, how I approach that particular caterpillar differently or it's going to eat all my food. But um, anyway, so plant it and they will come. This is just a pretty picture of the Reams Creek Nursery Pollinator Garden. I think this is the third year we've had it. And um, even the first year, it just looked beautiful and it's really starting to fill in nicely. We are having a tour of our pollinator garden next Saturday. We have one at 10 and one at two. And we're gonna go around the garden and talk about the plants individually, what we might have to say about them. Um, for instance, the October um, skies aster, we've managed it a certain way and just things we've had to do to manage the plants to keep the garden looking good and things we may have not gotten around to doing and we wish we had. So we invite you to um, sign up for that garden tour next um, Saturday. It is at the nursery. Here's another picture of it. Just a little bigger picture. And we have two different certification signs. We are certified by the Xerces Society. That's the sign you see here, but we're also certified by Asheville Greenworks B City USA Asheville. And that sign is just a little bit beyond those pink flowers on the on the right. So managing your pollinator garden. So think about the plant before you plant it. <clears throat> What does that plant like? Does it like sun? Does it like shade? Does it like soil type? In other words, um, a lot of the woodsy plants are going to like really humusy soil. They are not going to come up in the forest in hard, hard clay. They're going to come up in areas where that humus has been forming over many decades. Another trick you can use in your pollinator garden and um, is to deadhead your flowers. And if you keep on top of deadheading your flowers, it's going to prolong your bloom time, sometimes only to a certain extent. Um, but in the case of um, blanket flower, it will keep blooming all season. In the case of some of your coreopsis, that would be true. Um, 
in the case of one of our favorite ones, not really native to our area, but it's a penstemon called Red Rocks. Joy and I both love it. As she puts it, she loves seeing all the little bumblebee butts hanging out the bottom of the flowers. And um, we deadhead that usually three times a year and get four bloom cycles. The last bloom cycle is a little eh, but um, just an amazing plant. The other thing that um, I would say is don't be intimidated. If you don't like the way something looks, just move it. Or for instance, if I planted a bunch of new plants last year and I did follow directions on the plant label, but I feel like some of them are too close together. So I may have to move things around so that those plants can really shine. Or for instance, the stochesia I have in my garden. I, last year was its third year in my garden, but the two previous years, those zinnias I was talking about grew up all around that stochesia and it did not like it at all. It did not prosper. It did not look good by the end of the season. And so last year I moved it to a sunnier spot where it had more breathing room and it just shined. <laughs> be ready to edit your garden. Mm -hmm. So one of the great examples in our pollinator garden here at Reams Creek Nursery, the Black-Eyed Susan just really loves to expand itself. And it comes up not just next to where it was before, but it kind of comes up all over the garden. And so early in the year, we try to get in there and dig out those extra plants. Sometimes we try to repurpose them in another spot in um, some of our flower beds or give them away. But it, you definitely want to pay attention if you've got a limited space and you don't want your whole garden to be, for instance, Black-Eyed Susans, um, then... <laughs> you're gonna to wanna to edit that, or you may wanna pay attention in general. It's really good to leave a lot of your plants not cut back because that does help the pollinators. But if it's something that readily reseeds, you may wanna think about cutting those seed heads off at least so that um, you're not gonna to have to do a lot of work in the spring getting rid of all the seeds that got dropped. Um, some of the plants you're going to want to reseed. And right now in our pollinator garden at, at Reams Creek, one of the things I have not gotten to is um, removing a lot of baby liatris, which has taken over an entire area, probably not going to bloom this year. But I love liatris and I do um, like that it is reseeding. So, um, you can manage that or you can remove those babies and put them into little pots and kind of grow them on to put in a different spot in your garden or to give away to friends. Um, other things you're gonna want to make sure you have, you're gonna wanna have some sort of source of water. This is in my garden. I added rocks to this um, bird baths because pollinators do not like a deep bird bath. They only want shallow water. So I've added those so that the pollinators can get on there and have some shallow water. Um, you may have a water garden of some kind. I saw a incredible picture on um, Instagram or Facebook one time of this flowing fountain where all the water just flowed over the edge and there had to be like 20 hummingbirds in this fountain. It, none of it was deep water, but it was incredible. Another um, thing I read about was just take a, um, like a soft drink bottle and fill it up with water, rinse it out of course, fill it up with water, put the cap back on and tie it up somewhere like in a tree and um, poke a hole in the bottom, just a little tiny hole. And that is going to start dripping, dripping, dripping. And it could just drip into a shallow bowl um, with a few rocks in it, but most creatures love moving water, dripping water is going to attract a little um, more action than something that's not moving. Butterflies love mud puddles. You could actually build a mud puddle in your yard if you don't have a driveway that has mud puddles. 
the male butterflies are often feeding at these mud puddles to pump themselves up for mating with minerals. Um, if you have a pond or a stream, these are also places where pollinators are going to be visiting for a water source. <clears throat> the other kind of shelters you're wanting to provide are um, shelters for nesting and overwintering. So bare unmulched earth is going to support bumblebees and solitary bees. Look at that little cutie pie. And so <clears throat> just somewhere in your garden, you can leave a spot purposely that is bare so that these guys have a place to live and overwinter. What happens in um, the end of the season, the, the way bumblebees work is all of them are, all the females hatch and only at late in the season does the queen start laying males and then those males will um, mate with the females for the next year. And so at that point, um, at some point, then basically only those mated females are gonna overwinter and all the rest of the, them are going to die. So, but they need a little home to overwinter in. Another thing you can do in, um, is just leave some old logs around, leave, if you have a dead tree, you can leave that actually still standing. But even if you've just got some old sticks and logs and even like a brush pile, all of that is going to provide harbor for pollinators. Um, we talked about maybe not cutting your plants back. So um, that would be the pith of the stems and twigs that a lot of bees nest in the, the pith, which would be the center part of the stems of some of the plants that are in your garden. So if you can possibly leave those in place, I asked at the beginning of the season, well, what if I'm trying to cut my garden back, what do I do? And one of the friend, one of my friends on the um, Bee City Steering Committee said, she thought this would work. If anyone's out there that knows more, let me know that you could cut those stems off, but maybe lay them somewhere in your garden so that it's still the home for that solitary bumblebee. Also leaving leaf litter is really important. So just try to leave some areas that just have leaf litter. I mean, some people even just mulch with leaf litter and leave it there all the time, but maybe consciously make sure you leave some leaf litter about Patches of native grass are also a great spot. So that's a good, um, I did not mention grasses in the, in the flower talk, part of the talk, but um, that is another component of the garden. And it does offer a place that will harbor and shelter and overwinter some of these insects. Ideally, wait until spring to cut your garden back and even then be a little conscious about it. Bee hotels um, are a form of shelter, but you need to read up on them because they have to be properly maintained. It can cause disease. Um, okay, the next thing <clears throat> we're um, wanting to ask you to be thoughtful about is pesticides in your garden. So. Ideally, you're gonna avoid using any pesticides whatsoever in your pollinator garden because pesticides, insecticides specifically, are meant to kill insects and most of our pollinators are insects, right? But they have found that even herbicides and fungicides can act synergistically to um, exacerbate pollinator decline. So um, when we're thinking about that, one, maybe just try to get in a different headspace and be willing to accept some damage. It's not the end of the world if there's a few holes in some of your leaves, not a big deal. Um, if you are going to do something, you always want to use the softest method possible. The softest, softest method possible would be something like safer soap 
which is organic, but believe it or not, it is toxic to pollinators. Anytime you spray anything, you want to either avoid bloom time or absolutely avoid the blooms. You would want to apply anything as late in the evening as possible, dusk-ish, so that hopefully pollinators have gone home. But if you're uh, managing insects, another way to do it is just to squish them. I do that all the time. I squish eggs that I know are eggs I do not want in my garden, or I squish the larva, or I actually squish the bug. That particular bug is never going to reproduce if it has been squished. The same with dropping those insects into a jar of soapy water. Um, it won't work if you just drop it into plain water. The soap does something that doesn't, the bug cannot crawl back out of the soap. And so if you're squeamish about squishing bugs with your fingers, you can oftentimes just knock them into a jar of soapy water. You could, um, if you had a, you know, kind of a wide open plastic jar, you could just leave it somewhere, stash it in your garden so it's always there. Ideally, you want to avoid broad spectrum insecticides, and that includes organic insecticides. So something like pyrethrins, that's very broad spectrum, and that's going to kill a large, broad range of insects, pollinators. Um, for instance, let's just say I'm treating my kale. Well, the main pollinator that's going to be visiting my kale is going to be that white cabbage butterfly. And so if I spray my kale with BT, it is going to be toxic to that little caterpillar that comes to life on my kale and starts eating. But it's probably not going to be um, toxic to the, the other pollinators are not going to be visiting that because it isn't their host plant, if you follow me. So um, don't just spray the big bomb over everything. Be very targeted and very thoughtful if you're going to use anything at all. And make sure you're using the correct solution for the correct insect. Don't just go, oh my God, there's a bug. Um, you know, figure out what the bug is, who the bug is, and what's the solution to that problem. <clears throat> a big one is avoiding systemic insecticides, and included under that umbrella would be neonicotinoids, which you may have heard about in the news. And the, the concern with any systemic insecticide is that a systemic is going to be in every part of the plant. So it's going to be in the pollen, it's going to be in the nectar, it's going to be in the leaves. So when that pollinator visits the plant, it is going to be affected. And you can read on the label that you're not supposed to apply it during bloom time, but these are things that have a very long half-life, I think a thousand days. Um, a thousand days is, more than two years, not quite three years. Um, so that's a long time. A, a thing that a lot of people, I know I talked to a customer one time that was using um, a three-in-one product on her roses and she wasn't really thinking it through that she had these roses in her quote pollinator garden but that particular um, insecticide was targeting and going to be detrimental to insects visiting her garden. The other thing you want to do is try to get rid of the invasive plants in your yard. Don't plant anything that you know is invasive. Um, those invasive plants many times spread rapidly. And um, so, you know, try to do what you can to get rid of these invasive plants. The honeysuckle, the Japanese honeysuckle, that is not native. It is so prevalent everywhere in the Southeast that you would think it is native. It is not a native. And so, and it, we all know how fast that spreads. I had not encountered bittersweet until the yard I'm in right now. And it is crazy when it, in, this, in the fall, it's covered with berries. Birds are going to eat and poop it out. 
I just got um, bitten by yellow jackets last night trying to dig up some bittersweet roots by something that I had no idea yellow jackets were living under. But other common um, invasives, uh, lots of these are in my yard, English ivy, privet. If you can cut the privet berries off before they um, go to seed, that would be good, or cut the flowers off before they even go to berry, that would be ideal. Multiflora rose, the miscanthus grass, not all miscanthus is quite the same. There are some miscanthus that aren't that bad, but the ones you see along the highway that is highly invasive. That princess tree, which is the, it's already bloomed this season. It kind of looks like an upside down wisteria flower. It blooms along the highway, very invasive. Japanese barberry, drop seeds in the woods. Also not on this list is burning bush, drop seeds in the woods. Autumn olive, Japanese pyrea. Um, Whatever you can do to keep these plants feet back, it's going to leave more room for the plants that you really want in your yard that are more sustaining to pollinators. So we're going to jump now, unless you think there's a question I need to answer, Joy, into just a quick segment about getting your um, pollinator garden certified with Bee City USA Asheville. Are we good, Joy? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So recently, um, B City Asheville last year started a certification program for pollinator habitats. The yellow sign is the sign that indicates you're certified. So we're just going to talk about um, kind of just give you some hints so that if you decide you want to do that, it'll be a little easier. Um, <clears throat> One thing I think is really helpful is go to, if you go to our website and go under resources, we have this list on our website along with some other lists and along with a link to the application um, for this pollinator um, habitat certification. But if you go check out the plant list, it's gonna give you an idea of some of the things that you have in your yard that are there that maybe you don't even realize you could include in your pollinator habitat. First thing I need to say is that this certification is strictly for native plants. So some of the plants I've shown you today would not qualify. That perennial mum, not going to qualify. That catnip, not going to qualify. Those are not native plants, okay? So, um, but you would want to include your whole yard. So think about all the trees in your yard, the dogwood trees, maple trees, redbud trees, um, things you have growing in your backyard that you forgot about or your front yard that you forgot about. Include all your flower beds and list all the native trees, list all the native flowering shrubs, the native perennials, list your water sources or figure out how you're going to create a water source and list your nesting and overwintering areas, which honestly I had didn't have to do anything and my yard is not that tidy that I don't have some bare spots and um, sticks laying around, you know, and also take note of what invasive plants you have and kind of what you're doing to um, try to take care of those. The way this certification is organized, um, you can go very, very basic with just six um, flowering plants, two in each season, one host plant, a water source, removing invasives and avoiding pesticides. So that's the very simplest one. And then each tier, you're adding a little, a little more to it. At the very top tier, you've got five native trees and shrubs, 15 perennials, five in each season, four larval hosts, water sources, three forms of shelter, and again, removing invasives and avoiding pesticides. So before you even get into the application, I would count it up. What do you have? How many of each of these things do you have? 
divide the flowers into early, mid, and late season, and also the trees. Um, <clears throat> how many you have in each group, um, depending on which one of those tiers you're trying to get to, how many host plants do you have, um, I just looked at the list online and the old list actually um, said which plants were larval host plants, but I'm not sure that the new list says that. So um, what's your water source and what are your types of shelter? And then, so what I did with my own garden, I was like, well, I was gonna apply for the second level. And I thought, well, you know, I only need to add a few more plants to get to the third level. So before I applied, I actually added more plants so that I could get to the next level, which you may or may not care about, but I wanted to get to the next level. So um, always considering your bloom color, your plant size, your leaf texture, and your plant location, not just for the pollinators, but also for your enjoyment, because these gardens are so enjoyable for us. This is a link to that plant list, but like I said, you can find it on our website under resources. You can find it on the um, Asheville Greenworks um, website under programs um, and B, then go to Bee City. These are some other plant lists that you can access. The first one is the Mid-Atlantic region, which is the region we're actually considered to be in. The next one is the Southeast region, and I feel like there is a little bit of overlap. And this um, pollinator partnership list is for the Central Appalachian, has a lot of plants that would fit our area. So those are all good resources. And this is just a, a very quick example. If you were just going for the lowest tier, um, a couple of, here's a Coreopsis and a Yarrow, that would be the first, the early bloomers. The next bloomers would be the um, Echinacea and the Bee Balm. And then the, the last bloomers would be the Swamp Milkweed and the Goldenrod, and that Swamp Milkweed would also count as your host plant. This is another example. This is the next tier up. And the next tier up, you have to provide some trees or shrubs. So <clears throat> still, you've only got six flowering perennials, but you've got native trees or shrubs. In this, in this example, you've got Itea, which blooms early. And then you've got um, Clethra, which blooms about the middle of the summer. And so for the um, early bloomers, again, we've got Coreopsis and we've got Creeping Phlox. For the mid bloomers, we've got this beautiful false blue indigo and we've got butterfly weed. And then late, we've got um, Liatris, which is up at the very top and this New England Aster. So, um, those are just some pretty examples. If you want to have a sign, I think it costs $35 for the sign. It costs $10 to apply. And they're very cute signs that um, already come with a stake that all you have to do is screw the, screw the stake onto the sign and you're good to go. So these are <clears throat> just to show you some actual resources. This is this book, which I really, really like because it takes you through a number of butterflies and it shows you every stage, shows you the egg stage, the caterpillar stage, the chrysalis stage, and the butterfly stage. And it talks about plants that butterfly likes. It, it's not uh, oriented to um, native plants, but it's a great book. There's a, this book here is by the Xerces Society. So he, you know, a whole book about how to attract native pollinators, the Xerces Society. Um, I was just reading, they're a huge um, proponent of protecting pollinators and Bee City, they've actually, um, Bee City USA has become a part, one of the programs of the Xerces Society. And I think I read 
something like in 2004, they had something like four people on their staff and now they have, I wanna say a couple of hundred, they've really grown. They're really doing a lot of good work. Um, great other things to have, just some kind of way to figure out who these people are. Who are these bees? North Carolina butterflies and moss, who are they? It's just fun to know who they are. That um, brochure in this picture, Landscaping with Native Plants, is a great local resource. We do have them at Reams Creek Nursery. We're happy to give you a copy. We also have it on our website under resources. You can click on it and see it online. And this is, this is one of the kickoff events for this year's pollination celebration with Bee City USA Asheville. Reams Creek Nursery is one of the sponsors. And so I'm just going to let you know what this is the very first event, but we've got events all week long. So all this week, there's a pollinator um, photo contest with prizes, including a $100 gift card to Reams Creek Nursery. There's a bio blitz for pollination celebration, and that involves uploading all the pollinators you can find to iNaturalist. So you would have to start an iNaturalist account, but we're trying to document as many pollinators in our area as possible. Then on Monday night, Lisa Wagner, who a lot of you have seen doing programs for Reams Creek Nursery, is giving a creating a pollinator friendly garden zoom workshop that should be great then on wednesday night brian tompkins is giving a talk on the effects of artificial lighting on pollinators and this is um, a new subject that is just kind of coming to the fore of how much this is affecting our pollinators it's also affecting our bird populations and then on Thursday, there is a pollinator friendly landscape tour at New Belgium with Sarah Frazier. And then also on Thursday, a little later from six to eight is a talk with Sam Drogi about native bees, native plants in your role in bee conservation. I think it's also a walk that I, I might be mistaken. Then next Saturday, um, Tanya LaCorte and I are giving two different tours of the Reams Creek Nursery Pollinator Garden at 10 and at two. We will, like I said earlier, we'll talk about these plants individually, why we like them, what we do um, to manage them, et cetera. And then there's a Pocket Meadow and Monarch Way Station tour on Saturday from 12 to one with Emily Sampson of Patchwork Meadows. And the, the last thing on Sunday, um, the River Arts District has a beautiful greenway and recently a pollinator garden has been installed there that is supported by Bee City Asheville and there's more things in the works like a pollinator meadow but they have are going to have an information kiosk and a tour of that garden milkweed plant giveaway and Shanti elixir um, giveaway so just invite all of y'all to attend all of these events. They're all gonna be excellent. You can go to the Asheville Greenworks website. Most of them need to be registered for. The only one you don't need to register for is um, the very last one at the um, River Art, Art District's Greenway. And I just wanna thank all of y'all for coming today. Remind you that we're having this perennial special through June. And um, I hope you'll come see us here. We love seeing you. We're hoping that we're gonna be able to start doing our talks in person. We're sort of feeling our way in that direction. So um, thanks for coming today. And Joy, do we have any questions? Yes, yes, we do. Let me scroll up a bit. Okay. Um. We've got a question. Someone's just making certain that um, will they have access to this recording later? You, we should have access. We usually post it in our newsletter the following week. If unless there's a Zoom a glitch with Zoom, you will have access. Um, yes. 
and we're trying to figure out a YouTube channel where we could put stuff like that, but that's not happening yet. So yes, yeah, you will have access in about a week, like next Friday, it will be in our newsletter. Okay, next question. Other than flowering plants, what bushes should we plant that offer food and habitat for pollinators? There, there's just a huge list of bushes and I showed you a few. One of my favorites is Clethra, like I said, Itea. Um, did you say trees and bushes or just bushes? Shrubs. Bushes, bushes. Uh, okay. Um, but there's uh, most, uh, there's so many native bushes, button bushes, one, um, dire villa is one, um, the Cali Carpa, uh, beauty berry, American beauty berry, fringe tree, um, Annabelle hydrangea, oak leaf hydrangea, the, um, um, winterberry hollies, there, there's a huge list. Uh, it's, it's not all coming to my mind. And I'm telling you just the natives right now. Um, that isn't to say that pollinators do not feed on non-natives. They do many feed on many of our ornamental plants as well. I know last year I was blown away. I have a Japanese holly by my front door and I it was covered with bees at one point and the flowers on this are minute. They're probably like a 32nd of an inch, but the bees were just all over it. And so if you go to those plant lists that I mentioned under resources on our website, you will, there is a separate um, list just for trees and shrubs to, to get you going. Awesome. We did have a question of where can I buy milkweed starts? I think we have some swamp milkweed and some butterfly weed here. I don't think we have any common milkweed. It is hard to, for us and probably a lot of people to keep up with the demand for these starts. Um, I do know that at the River Arts District, they're giving away some milkweed starts. So at that, um, on Sunday, the event on Sunday from 11 to 3, it would be not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, I think the 27th. So if you haven't found them anywhere, but I know last I looked, and I'm not sure 100%, we had quarts of butterfly weed and we had gallons of swamp milkweed. And for the patient people, sometimes we also carry this too. What? For the patient, the patient folks, we also sometimes have seeds as well. Absolutely. Yes, we usually have seeds of, of at least um, common milkweed and butterfly weed. Okay, next question. Are orange, I'm sorry, are orange aphids bad? Um, well, you know, it, they, they can cover the plant. And so it is going to take some of the resources away from the plant. Um, I know one of the ways you can try to combat aphids is a strong spray of water. And I have done that on the swamp milkweed here in our garden. Um, but it's not like you're only going to do it once. You're going to have to do it repeatedly because, I mean, I... They, they were covered from head to toe with, with orange aphids and I sprayed them down and it seemed like two days later they were covered again. So um, if you're trying not to use any pesticides, the best way is with um, a hard, a not so hard you're gonna knock the plant over, but a strong spray of water and just keep at it. Okay, next question. Is meadow rue lavender mist good for pollinators? I am not absolutely sure about that. Um, I can't remember the botanical name of meadow rue. Is that Thelictrum? Yeah, she's got it in here. Thelictrum uh, rocha brudinum. I think it is. I don't, I can't remember if it's native, but I think it is good for pollinators, yes. Okay, it uh, looks like this is the last question. I have a large bank of English ivy. 
Do you recommend pulling it all up? Turtles and chipmunks love it. Um, I mean, I honestly, the thing about English ivy is it just doesn't behave. It doesn't stay contained. It goes everywhere. Um, it goes into your neighbor's yard. Maybe you could create, uh, use a different ground cover that would also create that kind of habitat. Um, I mean, ideally, yes, pull it up. It's a lot of work. <laughs> All right, that's it for the questions. Okay, thanks, Joy. And thanks to each and every one of you for coming today. We loved having you. And I hope you're all going to plant a pollinator garden. I think you'll get so much thrill out of it. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Thanks Bye. So for coming. Appreciate it.